Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together on the first Sabbath of the year. If all of the numbers are right and everything's accurate in Yobelim and the other things that we've been checking, it would be the year 5923 from creation, but that's in no way set in stone. However, it's the first month. It's the fourth day of the first month. And um, we are continuing with our Shabbat study of the recognitions of Clement. This is from book four, I believe, chapter 37. And this is Kef is still preaching and teaching as he's making his way up to Antioch or north to Antioch from the land of Yisrael there or Yahuda. So he was just going over the, the origin and unprofitableness of idolatry. And now he's going to cover the deceptions and suggestions of Satan or the old serpent. So it says, above all, therefore, you ought to comprehend the deception of the old serpent and his cunning suggestions, who deceives you, as it were, by prudence, and as by a sort of reason creeps through your senses, and beginning at the head, he glides through your inner marrow, or marrow, accounting the deceiving of you a great gain. Therefore, he insinuates into your minds opinions of Elohim of whatsoever kinds, only that he may withdraw you from the belief of Yahuwah Elohim, knowing that your sin is his comfort. For he, for his immorality, was condemned from the beginning to eat dust, for that he caused to the, be again resolved into dust, him who had been taken from the dust even till the time when your inner beings will be restored, being brought through the fire, as we will instruct you more fully at another time. From him, therefore, proceed all the errors and doubts by which you are driven from the belief or the trustworthiness and belief of one Elohim. His first suggestion and first of all, he suggests to men's thoughts not to hear the words of truth, by which they might put to flight the ignorance of those things that are evils. And this he does as by the presentation of another knowledge, making a show of that opinion that very many hold, to think that they will not be held guilty if they have been in ignorance and that they will not be called to account for what they have not heard. And thereby he persuades them to turn aside from hearing the word. But I tell you in opposition to this, that ignorance is in itself a most deadly poison, which is sufficient to ruin the ruach or spirit without any aid from without. And this is a difference between it, there is a difference between ignorance and what they call nescience, right? It's covered in the exhortation from the Damascus document, where it mentions that Dawid was not held accountable for the accumulation of many wives, even though it was strictly prohibited in the book of the law, because the book of the law was hidden in the Ark of the Covenant from the death of Eleazar and Yahushua until the coming of Zadok. And because he could not know, it was not possible for anyone to know, it was not held against him. So this is made clear right here. Ignorance will not save anyone. If you have the ability to know something and you choose not to, it won't help you. And therefore, there is no one who is ignorant who will escape through his ignorance, but it is certain that he will perish. For the power of sin naturally destroys the sinner. But since the judgment will be according to reason, the cause and origin of ignorance will be inquired into, as well as of every sin. For he who is unwilling to know how he may obtain to life 
and prefers to be in ignorance, lest he thereby be made guilty, is from this very fact judged as if he knew and had knowledge. <clears throat> For he knew what it was that he was unwilling to hear, and the cunning obtained by the artifice of the serpent will avail him nothing for an excuse, for he will have to do with him to whom the heart is open. But that you may know that ignorance of itself brings destruction, I assure you that when the Ruach, or inner being, departs from the body, if it leave it in ignorance of him by whom it was created, and from whom in this world it obtained all things that were necessary for its uses, it is driven forth from the light of his Malkuth, or kingdom, as ungrateful and untrustworthy. His second suggestion. Again, the immoral serpent suggests another opinion to men that many of you are in the habit of bringing forward. That there is, as we say, one Elohim who is master of all. But these also, they say, are Elohim. For as there is one Caesar, and he has under him many Shofotim, which is judges. For example, perfects, consuls, tribunes, and other officers. In like manner, we think that while there is one Elohim greater than all, Yet still, that these Elohim are ordained in this world, after the likeness of those officers of whom we have spoken, subject indeed to that greater Elohim, yet ruling us and these things that are in this world. In answer to this, I will show you how, in those very things that you propose for deception, you are confuted by the reasons of truth. You say that, Elohim occupies the place of Caesar, and that those who are called Elohim represent his judges and officers. Hold then as you have adduced it, by the example of Caesar, and know that as one of Caesar's judges or administrators, as perfects, proconsuls, generals, or tribunes, may lawfully take the name of Caesar, or else both he who should take it and those who should confer it should be destroyed together. So also in this case you ought to observe that if anyone give the name of Elohim to any but Yahuwah himself, and he accept it, they will partake one and the same, or they will partake in one and the same destruction by a much more terrible fate Thanks, than Lord. the servants of Caesar. Great. Just a moment. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Backing up a little. It says, hold then, as you have adduced it, by the example of Caesar, and know that as one of Caesar's judges or administrators, as perfects, proconsuls, generals, or tribunes, may lawfully take the name of Caesar, or else both he who should take it and those who should confer it should be destroyed together. So also in this case, you ought to observe that if anyone give the name of Elohim to any but Yahuwah himself, and he accept it, they will partake one and the same or of one and the same destruction by a much more terrible fate than the servants of Caesar. For he who offends against Caesar will undergo corporal destruction or bodily destruction. But he who offends against him who is the sole and true Elohim will suffer ageless punishment, and that deservedly, as having injured by wrongful condition the name that is unique. <clears throat> Although this word Elohim is not the name of Elohim, but meantime that word is employed by men as his name. Therefore, as I have said, when it is used reproachfully, that reproach is referred to the injury of the true name. In short, in ancient Mitzrayim, or Mitzrayim, if you will, who thought that they had discovered the theory of the Shamayim revolutions 
and the nature of the stars. Nevertheless, through the demons blocking up their senses, subjected the true name Yahuwah to all kinds of indignity. And if you're familiar, there's some people have actually denied our creator's name because there's idols in Mitzrayim or Mitzrayim, Egypt, that have his name on it. <clears throat> this is admitting that that's what they did. And um, that's another reason why he showed his power through them and they were punished in such a manner, also judged according to their idols, just like Rome is that you see throughout Revelation in the anti-Mashiach or anti-Christ for Dummies videos. You also see that distinctly spoken of in the Hokma Shalomo or Wisdom of Solomon. But he says, for some taught that their ox, which is called Apis, ought to be worshipped. Others taught that the he-goat, others that cats, the ispis, a fish also, a serpent, onions, drains, and the breaking of wind ought to be regarded as mighty ones, and innumerable other things which I am ashamed even to mention. When Kepha was speaking thus, all we who had heard him laughed. Then said Kepha, you laugh at the absurdities of others because through long custom you do not see your own. For indeed, it is not without reason that you laugh at the folly of the Mitzrayim, who worship dumb animals, while they themselves are rational. But I will tell you how they also laugh at you. For they say we worship living animals, though mortal, but you worship and adore things that were never alive at all. They add this also that they are figures and allegories of certain powers by whose help the race of men is governed. Taking refuge in this for shame, they fabricate, or they fabricate these and similar excuses and so endeavor to screen their error. But this is not the time to answer the Mitzrayim and leaving the care of those who are present to heal the disease of the absent. For it is a certain indication that you are hit or held, rather, to be free from sickness of this sort, since you do not grieve over it as your own, but laugh at it as that of others. But let us come back to you, whose opinion it is that Elohim, or that Yahuwah, should be regarded as Caesar, and the false mighty ones, as if they were the ministers and deputies of Caesar. Follow me attentively, and I will presently show you how the lurking places of the serpent, which lie in the crooked windings of this argument. It ought to be regarded by all as certain and beyond doubt that no creature can be on a level with Elohim, because he was made by none, but he made all things. Nor indeed can anyone be found so irrational as to suppose that the thing made can be compared with the maker. If therefore the, man, the mind of man, not only by reason, but even by a sort of natural instinct, rightly holds this opinion, then how can it be supposed that that which is called Elohim, to which nothing can be compared or equaled, but that exceeds all and excels all, how can it be supposed that that name that is above all is rightly given to those false Elohim or false mighty ones whom you think to be employed for the service and comfort of man's life? But we will add this also. This world was undoubtedly made and is corruptible, as we will show more fully as we go along. In the meantime, it is admitted both that it has been made and that it is corruptible. If, therefore, the world cannot be called mighty Elohim, and rightly so, because it is corruptible, how will parts of the world take the name of Elohim? For inasmuch as the whole world cannot be Elohim, much more its parts cannot. Therefore, 
if we come back to the example of Caesar, you will see how far you are in error. It is not lawful for anyone, though a man of the same nature with him, to be compared with Caesar. Do you think then that anyone ought to be compared with Elohim, who excels all in this respect, which he was made by none, but he himself made all things? But indeed you dare not give the name of Caesar to any other, because he immediately punishes the one who offends against him. Yet you dare give that of Elohim to others because he delays the punishment of offenders against him in order to give them time for their repentance. Third suggestion. Through the mouths of others, also that serpent is prone to speak in this manner. We adore visible images in honor of the invisible Elohim. Now this is most certainly false. For if you really desire to worship the image of Elohim, you would do good to man, and so worship the true image of Elohim in him. And notice he's, he doesn't make it conditional to men that are nice, or men that are good to you, or men that you think are worthy of it, because our Mashiach, he, he commends those who do right for those who persecute, hate, speak evil, and afflict them. And then he set the example of that where while he was on you know, going to the execution stake or suffering for it, he says, forgive them for they know not what they do. Right. Did not revile his accusers, did not return evil for evil. And he set the example for us to follow. For the image of Elohim is in every man, though his likeness is not in all. But where the inner being is benign and the mind pure. If therefore you desire truly to honor the image of Elohim, we declare to you what is true that you should do good to and pay honor and reverence to man who is made in the image of Elohim, that you minister food to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, clothing to the naked, hospitality to the stranger and necessary things to the prisoner, and that is what will be regarded as truly bestowed upon Elohim. And so far do these things go to the honor of Elohim's image, that he who does not do these things is regarded as casting reproach upon Yahuwah's image. What then is that honor of Elohim that consists in running from one stone or wooden figure to another? in venerating empty and lifeless figures as mighty ones, and despising men in whom the image of Elohim is of, is of a truth. Yea, rather be assured that whoever commits murder or adultery or anything that causes suffering or injury to men, in all these the image of Elohim is violated. For to injure men is a great offense towards Elohim. And to cause injury to men, whether it's the, the person, character, or property, is the only thing under the common law in which you can sue for re remedy or redress of grievances against the injure, you know, the injury. If there is no injury, there's no crime. And that's right here in scripture too. For to injure men is a great offense towards Elohim. Whenever, therefore, you do to another what you would not have another do to you, you defile the image of Elohim with undeserved distresses. Comprehend, therefore, that that is the suggestion of the serpent lurking within you, who persuades you that you may seem to be obedient when you worship insensible things, and may not seem disobedient when you injure sensible and rational beings. Fourth suggestion. But to these things, the serpent answers us with another mouth and says, If Yahuwah did not desire these things to be, then they should not be. 
I am not telling you how it is that many contrary things are permitted to be in this world for the probation of everyone's mind. But this is what is suitable to be said in the meantime. If, according to you, everything that was to be worshipped ought not to have been, there would have been almost nothing in this world. For what is there that you have left without worshipping it? The sun, the moon, the stars, the water, the earth, mountains, trees, stones, men, there is no one of these that you have not worshipped. According to your saying, sorry about that. Therefore, none of these ought to have been made by Elohim, that you might not have anything that you could worship. Yea, he ought not even to have made men themselves to be the worshipers. But this is the very thing that the serpent that lurks within you desires, for he spares none of you. He would have no one of you escape from destruction, but it will not be so. For I tell you that not that which is worshipped is at fault, but he who worships. For with Yahuwah is righteous judgment, and he judges in one way the sufferer, and in another way the doer of wrong. The fifth suggestion. And that's just another way of saying everyone gets according to what they deserve, right? But you say... Then those who adore what ought not to be adored should be immediately destroyed by Elohim to prevent others doing the like. But are you wiser than Elohim that you should offer him counsel? He knows what to do. For with all who are placed in ignorance, he exercises patience because he is merciful and favorable. And he foresees that many of the immoral become righteous and that even some of those who worship impure statues and polluted images have been converted to Elohim, and forsaking their sins and doing good works obtain to deliverance. But it is said, we ought never to have come even to the thought of doing these things. You do not know what freedom of will is, and you forget that he is good who is so by his own intention. But he who is retained in goodness by necessity cannot be called good, because it is not of himself that he is so. Because, therefore, there is in every one liberty to choose good or evil, he either acquires rewards or brings destruction on himself. Nay, it is said, Elohim brings to our minds whatsoever we think. What do you mean then, you blaspheme? For if he brings all our thoughts into our minds, then it is he that suggests to us thoughts of adultery and covetedness and blasphemy and every kind of effemacy. Cease, I entreat you, these blasphemies and comprehend what is the honor worthy of Elohim. And say not, as some of you are likely to say, that Elohim needs not honor from men. Indeed, he truly is in need of none. But you ought to know that the honor that you bestow upon Elohim is profitable to yourselves. For what is so disgusting as for a man not to render thanks to his creator? Sixth suggestion. But it is said, we do better who give thanks both to himself and to all with him. In this, you do not comprehend that there is the ruin of your deliverance. For it is as if a sick man should call in for his cure at once a physician and poisoners, since the latter could indeed injure him, but not cure him. And the true physician would refuse to mix his remedies with their poisons least either man's destruction should be ascribed to good or to the good or his recovery to the injurious. But you say, is Elohim then indignant or envious if when he benefits us, 
our thanks be rendered to others. Even if he is not indignant at all events, he does not desire to be the author of error, which by means of his work credit should be given to a vain idol. And what is so evil and so ungrateful as to obtain a benefit from Elohim and to render thanks to blocks of wood and stone? So arise and comprehend your deliverance, for Yahuwah is in need of no one, nor does he require anything, nor is he hurt by anything. But we are either helped or hurt in that we are grateful or ungrateful. For what does Elohim gain from our praises? Or what does he lose by our blasphemies? Only this we must remember, that Elohim brings into proximity and friendship with himself the inner being that renders thanks to him. But the immoral demon possesses the ungrateful inner being. Cre but this I all, this is an interesting section, right? Something that we should be paying attention to. And if you, the more you look at how revelation plays out, you see that this is true. Creation takes vengeance on sinners. But this also I would have you know that upon such inner beings, Elohim does not take vengeance directly, but his whole creation rises up and inflicts punishments upon the immoral. And although in the present world, the goodness of Yahuwah bestows the light of the world and the services of the earth alike upon the obedient and the disobedient, yet not without grief does the sun afford his light and the other elements perform their service to the disobedient. And in short, sometimes even in opposition to the goodness of the creator, the elements are wearied by the crimes of the immoral. And from there, it is that either the fruit of the earth is blighted, or the composition of the air is corrupted, or the heat of the sun is increased beyond measure or there is an excessive amount of rain or of cold. From there, pestilence, famine, and death in various forms stark, stalk forth. For the creation hastens to take vengeance on the immoral. Yet the tobim, or goodness of Elohim, restrains it, bridles its indignation against the immoral, and compels it to be obedient to his loving kindness rather than to be inflamed by the sins of the, and the crimes of men. For the patience of Elohim waits for the conversion of men, as long as they remain in this body. But if any persist in immortality, or sorry, immorality till the end of life, then as soon as the inner being, which is immortal, departs, it will pay the penalty of its persistence in immorality. For even the inner beings of the disobedient are immortal. Just a moment. To continue here, it says, for even the inner beings, it says spirits right here, but for whatever reason, this translation regularly puts spirits where it should say inner beings because they are distinct and separate. The inner being of a man is the nefesh, or what the breath of life that was breathed into them at the beginning, that he became a living being. But the ruach is the influence either from, it says, the Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, or Melchirasha, the king of evil. So there's a difference between these. It says, for even the inner beings of the disobedient are immortal though it is likely they themselves would desire them to end with their bodies. But it is not so, for they endure without end the torments of ageless fire, and to their destruction they have not the quality of mortality. But maybe you will say to me, you terrify us, Kepha. 
And how will we speak to you the things that are in reality? Can we declare to you the truth by keeping silence? We cannot state the things otherwise than as they are. But if we were silent, we should make ourselves the cause of the ignorance that is ruinous to you and should satisfy the serpent that lurks within you and blocks up your senses who cunningly suggest these things to you that he may make you always the enemies of Yahuwah. But we are sent for this end that we may betray his disguises to you and melting your enmities may reconcile you to Elohim that you may be converted to him and may please him by good works. For man is at enmity with Elohim and is in an unreasonable and rebellious state of mind and immoral disposition towards him, especially when he thinks that he knows something and yet is in ignorance. But when you lay aside these and begin to be pleased and displeased with the same things that please and displease Yahuwah and to will what he or what Yahuwah wills, then you will truly be called his Havarim or friends. But maybe some of you will say, Elohim has no care for man's things. And if we cannot even obtain to the knowledge of him, how will we obtain to his friendship? That Elohim does concern himself with the affairs of men. His government of the world bears witness, for the sun daily waits upon it. The showers minister to it. The fountains, rivers, winds, and all elements attend upon it. And even more, these things become known to men. Sorry. And the more these things become known to men, the more do they indicate Yahuwah's care over men. For unless by the power of the Most High, the more powerful would never minister to the inferior. And by this Elohim is shown to have not only a care over men, but some great affection. Since he also, or since he has disputed such noble elements to their service. But that men may also obtain to the friendship of Elohim is proved to us by the example of those who or to whose prayers he has been so favorable that he has withheld the sky from rain when they desired and has again opened it when they prayed and many other things. He has bestowed upon those who do his will, which could not be bestowed but upon his friends. And here's another great example. Noah, after the flood, made propitiation and prayed that something like that would never happen again. And he heard his voice, and it never has. He promised him it wouldn't. But you will say, what harm is done to Elohim if these things also are worshipped by us? If any one of you should pay to another the honor that is due to his father, from whom he has received innumerable benefits, and should reverence a stranger and a foreigner as his father, should you not think that he was undutiful towards his father and most deserving to be disinherited? Others say it is immoral if we do not worship those idols that have come down to us from our fathers and prove false to the religion bequeathed to us by our ancestors. On this principle, if anyone's father was a robber or a base fellow, he ought not to change the manner of life handed down to him by his fathers, nor to be recalled from his father's errors to a better way. And it is reckoned evil if one does not sin with his parents, or does not persist in evil with them. Others say, we ought not to be troublesome to Elohim, and to be always burdening him with complaints of our miseries, or with the exigences of our petitions. 
How foolish and witless an answer. Do you not think it troublesome to Elohim if you thank him for his benefits? While you do not think it troublesome to him, if for his gifts, you render thanks to stocks and stones. And how comes it that when rain is withheld in a long drought, we all turn our eyes to the sky and entreat the gift of rain from Yahuwah Almighty. And all of us with our little ones pour out prayers on Elohim and entreat his compassion. But truly, ungrateful beings, when they obtain the Baraka, quickly forget. For as soon as they have gathered in the har their harvest or their vintage, straight away they offer the first fruits to deaf and dumb images and pay vows in temples or groves for those things that Yahuwah Elohim has bestowed upon them, and then offer sacrifices or zabachim to demons, and having received a favor, they deny the bestower of the favor. But some say these things are instituted for the sake of joy and for the refreshing of and for refreshing our minds. And they have been devised for this end, that the mind of man may be relaxed for a little from the cares and sorrows. See now what a charge you yourselves bring upon the things that you practice. If these things have been invented for the purpose of lightening sorrow and affording enjoyment, how is it that the invocations of demons are performed in groves and woods? What is the meaning of the insane whirlings and the slashing of limbs and the cutting off of members? How is that mad rage is produced in them? How is insanity produced? How is it? How is it that Sorry, I lost my spot. Oh, there we go. That women are driven violently, raging with disheveled hair. Whence shrieking and gnashing of teeth. Whence the bellowing of the heart and the bowels. And all those things that, whether they are pretended or contrived by the ministration of demons, are exhibited to the terror of the foolish and ignorant. Are these things done for the sake of lightening the mind, or rather for the sake of oppressing it? And this would be like the, the pagan feast and the, the things that they would do in the woods and whatnot. They call uh, the Greek version Brachianalis or whatever. Later on, they turned it into party festivals and stuff that were more common in cities. But it says, do you not yet perceive nor comprehend that these things are the consuls or the counsels of the serpent lurking within you, which draws you away from the apprehension of truth by irrational suggestions of errors, that he may hold you as slaves and servants of lust and obscenity and every dishonorable thing. But I protest, which... Protest came to us from the Latin protestari, and it's actually in the uh, in Revelation, and it means to witness, right? But I witness to you with a clear voice of preaching that, on the contrary, obeying Yahuwah's Torah calls you to sobriety and modesty, orders you to refrain from effemacy and madness. And by patience and gentleness to prevent the inroads of anger. To be content with your own possessions and with the virtue of frugality. Not even when driven by poverty to plunder the goods of others. But in all things to observe right ruling. To withdraw yourselves wholly from the idol zebachim or sacrifice. For by these things you invite demons to you, and of your own accord give them the power of entering into you. And so you admit that which is the cause either of madness or of false love removed from Torah. 
meaning love that isn't reproving your neighbor for their sins. Hence is the origin of all immorality. Hence murders, adulteries, thefts, and a nursery is formed of all evils and immoralities. While you indulge in profane libations and odors and give immoral ruach oath or spirits an opportunity of ruling and obtaining some sort of authority over you. For when they invade your senses, what are they doing other than working the things that belong to lust and unrighteousness and cruelty and compel you to be obedient to all things that are pleasing to them? Elohim indeed permits you to suffer this at their hands by a certain righteous judgment that from the very dishonor of your doings and your feelings, you may comprehend how unworthy it is to be subject to demons and not to Elohim. Hence also by the friendship of demons, men are brought to dishonorable and base deeds. Hence men proceed even to the, the, the destruction of life, either through the fire of lust or through the madness of anger, through excess of grief, so that, as is well known, some have even laid violent hands upon themselves. And this, as we have said, is by righteous sentence of Elohim, that they are not prevented from doing, that they may both comprehend to whom they have yielded themselves in subjection, and know whom they have forsaken. Says, yet someone will say, these passions sometimes befall even those who worship Yahuwah. It is not true, for we say that he is a worshiper of Elohim who does the will of Elohim and observes the precepts of his Torah. For in Elohim's estimation, he is not a Yahudi or one who prays, praises, confesses, and acknowledges Yahuwah who is called a Yahudi among men, nor is he a Goy or a Gentile that is called a Goy. But he who believing in Elohim fulfills his Torah and does his will, though he be not circumcised, he is the true worshiper of Elohim, who not only is himself free from passions, but also sets others free from them though they are so heavy that they are like mountains. He removes them by means of the belief with which he believes in Elohim. Yea, by belief he truly removes mountains with their trees if it be necessary. But if, he, sorry, but he who seems to worship Elohim, but is neither fortified by a full belief nor by obedience to the commandments, but is a sinner, has given a place in himself by reason of his sins to passions, which are appointed of Elohim for the punishment of those who sin, that they may exact from them the deserts of their sins by means of punishments inflicted, and may bring them purified to the general judgment of all, provided always that their belief do not fail them in their chastisement, which means patiently enduring the things that you have happened to you, right? And again, Sovereign Dawid is an excellent example. How after he was reproved for his sin in the case of Oriyahu or and his wife, he showed humility. He was humble. He turned the other cheek. He forgave those that were offensive to him. And he, he did not retaliate when things happened. He was showing patience and enduring patiently in love the things that happened because he wanted forgiveness. This is for the chastisement of unbelievers in the present life is a judgment by which they begin to be separated from future Virako or their blessings. But the chastisement of those who worship Elohim 
while it is inflicted upon them for sins into which they have fallen, exacts from them the due of what they have done, that before their judgment they may pay the debt of their sin in the present life and may be freed, sorry, and be freed at least in half from the ageless punishments that are there prepared. But he does not receive these things as true who does not believe that there is to be a judgment by Elohim. And therefore, being bound by the pleasures of the present life, is shut out from ageless tobe or good things. And therefore, we do not neglect to proclaim to you what we know to be necessary for your deliverance and to show you what is the true worship of Elohim, that believing in Elohim, you may be able, by means of good works, to be heirs with us of the world to come. But if you are not yet convinced that what we say is true, meantime in the first instance, you ought not to take it amiss and to be hostile to us because we announce to you the things that we consider to be good, and because we do not grudge to bestow also upon you that which we believe brings deliverance to ourselves, laboring, as I have said, with all eagerness, that we may have you as fellow heirs of the Birach Oath or blessings that we believe are to befall ourselves. But whether those things that we declare to you are certainly true you will not be able to know otherwise than by rendering obedience to the things that are commanded. That you may be taught by the issue of things and the most certain end of blessedness or Birach Oath. There's another admittance right there that you cannot comprehend things correctly unless you are obedient to the commandments that you know to be written. And therefore, although that serpent lurking within you occupies your senses with a thousand arts of corruption and throws in your way a thousand obstacles by which he may turn you away from the hearing of delivering instruction, all the more ought you to resist him and despising his suggestions to come together the more frequently to hear the word and receive instruction from us, because nobody can learn anything who is not taught. And when he had done speaking, he ordered those to be brought to him who were oppressed by sickness or demons, and laid his hands upon them with prayer. And so he dismissed the crowds, charging them to resort to the hearing of the word during the days that he was to remain there. Therefore, when the crowds had departed, Kepha washed his body in the waters that ran through the garden, with as many of the others as chose to do so, and then ordered the couches to be spread on the ground under the very shady tree, and directed us to recline according to the order established at Caesarea, or Caesarea. And thus, Having taken food and given thanks to Elohim after the manner of the Hebrews, as there was yet some portion of the day remaining, he ordered us to question him on any matters that we pleased. And although we were with him twenty in all, he explained to every one whatever he pleased to ask of him, the particulars of which I set down in scrolls and sent to you some time ago. And when evening came, we entered with him into the lodging and went to sleep, each one in his own place. I'm sorry, that was book five, apparently, not book four. 